I told Ann I'd read if it was a short reading, and she came, she came through for me. Um, it's just two verses today. Uh, first, Romans 12, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. And John 11, 35. Jesus wept. Thank you, Stacy. When I was in college, the mother of a friend of mine died suddenly. As I gathered with a few others in his room, I had no idea what to say. At that point in my life, the only people I was even remotely close to who had died were great-grandparents. One of my grandfathers had died, but I was less than two at the time. So I had no real experience of loss. And I sat in that room feeling really uncomfortable. I was especially uncomfortable when things fell silent. I felt like everybody's so unhappy and I thought there must be some silver lining somewhere that could lighten the mood in the room. And so I said what is to date probably the worst and most inappropriate thing I have ever said to anyone in my life. And I said, at least you won't have to worry about a Mother's Day card. <laughs> I mean, really, I, I remember remember that moment. It was wrong on so many levels. I want to crawl under a rock every time I remember having said it. And it happened, and it, not to mention, you know, had my mother ever heard it, so you resent sending me Mother's Day cards then, <laughs> you know. There's just all, all kinds of things that were wrong with that. But it happened because I had no idea what to say and I was unable to just sit in silence. I wanted to help, I wanted to make things better, and I ended up doing just the opposite. Last week when we talked about the book of Job and God's condemnation of Job's friends slinging bad theology around while he was suffering, telling Job he must somehow be at fault for the enormous losses, and even accusing him of lying when he said, but I didn't do anything. What we didn't talk about last week was the fact that at the beginning of Job's misfortune, Job's friends did exactly the right thing. They came and they were with him and they just sat there with him in silence. But in time, for them, too, the silence became too uncomfortable. They became impatient with his misery and wanted to lift the cloud and get things back to normal. Where's my old buddy Job? You know, we, we want to get back to normal. And so they began to speak. And just like with me, they said exactly the wrong things. And so here on Father's Day, when a father and mother in this congregation have now lost the second of their two children to tragedy. I want to use this time to talk through what is and is not helpful to those who are suffering, so that maybe you can avoid mistakes like mine and the mistakes made by Job's friends. On the one hand, there isn't any cookie-cutter response to loss. Every situation is unique. We have unique relationships with those who are in distress, and we each have our own unique strengths, weaknesses, and experiences that we bring to those situations. But there are some general principles that we can apply, so that's where I want to focus. The single verse from Paul that Stacy read in Romans 12:15 is a really solid guide for how to be with people, both in good times and in bad. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Forgetting that is what got me into trouble. I wanted to pull my friend out of the terrible grief he was experiencing. I cared about him, but it's also true that his grief 
was making me uncomfortable. When I couldn't keep my own discomfort at bay and simply weep with someone who was weeping, I should have just said, I can't stay, but I wanted you to know how sorry I am for your loss. If I had just shown up and left when my discomfort began to surface, I would have shown that I cared and I wouldn't have ended up adding to his hurt. Ironically, Christians can be especially prone to ignoring Paul's advice to weep with those who weep. The church where I grew up was filled to the brim with compassionate, loving people. But at the time of a death, there was a strong sense that grief was not really appropriate. The one who had died had gone to glory and we should put self-pity aside and celebrate their resurrection day. Those folks would do anything and everything to help with the practical needs of those who had experienced the death of a loved one. But any tears for more than a second were met with some version of victory in Jesus. On the one hand, that is the Christian promise. It's not that what they proclaimed in such moments were false, but it also disregarded the very real pain of loss. When we take time to weep with those who weep, we're helping people enter into the grieving process, which is normal and healthy and necessary. Being taught to stuff my grief away was harmful to both my physical and emotional health for over a decade. If you want further proof that weeping with those who weep is sage advice, I'll point you to the other verse that Stacy read. And if you're ever on Jeopardy, it is the shortest verse in the entire Bible, at least in the King James. John 11:35, two words, Jesus wept. The context of those verses makes weeping an actual puzzling thing for Jesus to do. As we read through the Gospels, we learn that Jesus had not only his 12 disciples around him, but he had friends, people who put him up for the night, people that he hangs out with when he's not feeding 5,000 people on a hillside somewhere. Once you leave the inner circle of the 12, it appears that his three best friends are three siblings who live together in the town of Bethany just outside of Jerusalem, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Those three are so close to Jesus that when Lazarus gets seriously ill and Jesus is back home 70 miles away or so, they send somebody to go find Jesus. I mean, when one of your best friends is performing miraculous healings all over the place, you can count on him to show up for you, right? Well, Jesus gets the message and doesn't come. By the time Jesus does show up, Lazarus has been dead for four full days, and his sisters are livid. Mary wouldn't even show up to see Jesus when he arrives, and Martha, who's there to greet him, lets him have it. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Mary finally gets pulled out of the house to greet Jesus, she says the exact same thing. Jesus then asks to go to the tomb. But here's the thing. John's gospel implies that Jesus knows what he is going to do and that in fact he delayed coming for exactly that reason. He has come to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead. I mean, if, me, if it were me, I'd be saying, I know, I know you're upset, but follow me. Pull out your phone. Come on. You're, you're not going to believe what we're going to see next. But the Bible tells us that when Jesus sees Mary and Martha and the others who have gathered all weeping, he was, quote, greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. And then he weeps right along with them. He's going to raise Lazarus from the dead literally within the next 10 minutes. And he's standing there crying with the mourners. Why? I think he's crying because that's what love does. We weep with those who weep. 
even if we have insider information, even if we think there's no real reason for somebody to be upset, or that there are better days coming just around the corner. Grief is to be honored. Back on Mother's Day, I talked about what it means to honor. It's to give weight to something, to treat a concern seriously. Jesus here shows us how to honor grief. Despite knowing that he's about to perform his greatest miracle to date, Jesus honors the grief of his friends. He weeps both for them and with them. That is the number one principle of being present with anyone, no matter what they're feeling. When s what someone feels is what they feel, whether it's joy, grief, anger, whatever. You can help keep people from acting on those feelings in destructive ways. Weeping with those who weep doesn't mean ignoring a suicide attempt. It just means that you recognize that this moment is about them, not you. And you do all you can to understand how they're feeling and share the load. We don't need to have answers. It's not a time to teach or preach. Bite your tongue if you feel like saying, God needed another angel in heaven, or everything happens for a reason, or some other platitude. Sitting in silence and holding a hand is perfectly acceptable. If you're very close to that person, it might, you might sit there for a long time, or it might be just a small, quick gesture at the door, or when you go through a receiving line at a funeral. If you show up, you've conveyed your sympathy, and a silent gesture of concern will never get you into trouble. If that feels awkward, or if showing up in person is going to be difficult for you, you can send a card. Obviously, if you make a phone call, silence is going to be creepy. <laughs> so <laughs> you do need to say something if you're going to make a phone call. But if you're nervous about it, remembering that the purpose of the call is just to register that you care. I just heard and wanted to call and say I care and I'm praying for you. That's all you need to say. If you feel like you can go further, you can offer, can I pray for anything specific for you? If the other person is talking, you can just listen. That's, we often get in trouble because we think it should be harder or that there's, there's something more we should do. And all of what I've talked about so far is designed to help us, help keep us from doing harm while sending the message that we care. But there are other ways to be helpful if you're able. Some people just find it difficult to sit still for anything. And if that's you, there are frequently things that somebody in any kind of a crisis can actually use help with. The most basic of these is food. Sometimes that might be groceries, but more often it's a prepared meal or something that can be offered to other visitors who come to the door because there's a, often a steady stream of those. Often a church will coordinate meal delivery to make sure there aren't 10 meals one day and then nothing for a week. But dropping by with some fruit, a meal, some baked goods is always welcome. And if you really want to be helpful with food, spread it out. While there is a moment of crisis, when you first learn what has happened, the impact of that crisis can go on for a very long time. Those of us who want to respond tend to do so in the first few days, flooding our friends with attention and care, which is great and appreciated and helpful. But then it all disappears just as quickly, just as they're beginning to really feel the depth of their loss, get over the shock, since the empty house. When my father died, we had food literally rotting on our countertops. The fridge was packed, the freezer was packed, and we could not eat everything fast enough to keep the food from spoiling. It was appreciated in the moment, 
especially if you knew my mother's inability to cook, which is maybe why they brought so much. <laughs> But it would have been much better if some of those folks had stopped by two or three weeks later as we sat alone with our loss. And she couldn't cook then either. So, <laughs> you know, s spread it out. Um, and food is not the only thing. The situation varies according to the crisis. But there may be a need for somebody to walk the dog, to take the kids for a day, to mow the lawn, or to help put all that food into the fridge or freezer or get some containers to hold it all. Some people might need help with the maze of paperwork for insurance claims or taxes or death certificates and social security. Others might need a ride, help finding a place to live, or help making phone calls. Some might just need another person in the house for a few hours or even a night or two to ease their fears or to make the house seem less empty. Just a general, do you need anything, isn't likely to produce an answer. And a lot of people are reluctant to impose on others. But if you know a person well enough, you can call or show up and make a very specific suggestion. I'm taking my kids to the park. Do your kids want to come along? I'm free this morning, and I feel like mowing a lawn. You got one I can mow? <laughs> I made a big pot of soup. Can I bring you some? Or would next week be better? But if a person is adamant about not needing help, don't push it. While some are overwhelmed and are grateful for help, others value the distraction that doing all of those little tasks provide. If you make an offer, try to be specific. If it's refused, respect that. Remember that it's about them, not you. It's about what they need, not what you think they need, or what you would want if it was you. My final tip is perhaps the thing with the greatest potential for healing over time. You can help facilitate the sharing of stories. Stories are the building blocks of human relationships. And in many ways, the stories that we tell about ourselves and our circumstances shape our reality. A key stumbling block to healing after a tragedy is the inability to talk about it, or sometimes even to acknowledge it. The community rituals around crises, whether they're in a religious setting or not, are a way to help people find a story that can bring comfort, hope, and the sense that we are not alone, either in that moment or in having crises and moments of grief. We are not the first people to walk down this road and we will not be the last. And we can do that not only as a community, but as individuals. All you need to begin are two words said in a warm, caring voice. What happened? Then be quiet and let the other person decide whether they are willing or able to tell you. It doesn't matter if you already know what happened in great detail. It doesn't matter if you were there. <laughs> let them tell it if they can. But also honor their right not to speak if they're not ready. I just can't talk about it yet. Or I'm still processing. Or whatever someone says in response can be followed with I understand. I can't even imagine what you're going through. I'm here if you ever do want to talk about it. While it should never become all about us, there are times when sharing our own stories is appropriate. Many times at the wakes or visiting hours for those that I've lost, people came with their own memories of my father or mother or dear friends, often stories I'd never heard, sometimes from before I was born. Those stories helped me understand the full picture of the people that I had lost, their impact on others out in the world, how many people loved them and remembered them fondly. They added new dimensions to the people I had known and brought me new understanding of who they were. You know, hearing about my mother's tea parties as a child helped me understand why she always had warm milk with a dab of tea <laughs> instead of the other way around. Um, 
sometimes others told me their own experiences of what it was like when they had gone through a similar loss and what they did to cope. The sharing of stories is a time of community wisdom, sometimes bringing a balm of laughter and helping each other through. And if you do say something inappropriate, there's at least one man who's now about 60 years old out there in the world somewhere who can tell the story of this girl in college who said the most inappropriate thing imaginable when his mother died, but, you know, he let it go because, well, at least she came, and it's hard to know what to say, you know? Amen. Amen. <laughs>